I think we're almost right on time. So, um, hello everyone. Welcome to the workshop of Wittgenstein's philosophy in times of crisis. My name is Wei Zeng, and I will be the moderator of today's session. So before we start, uh, I would like to ask you to keep yourself muted during the whole session and use your full name in hopefully in the alphabet so that we can all read the names. And, but you can turn your camera on actually, if you would like to. Um, for, the, for the discussion, please write down your question or comments at, by using the chat function at Zoom. And let me uh, briefly introduce this workshop. This workshop aims to bring together Wittgenstein scholars all over the world to reflect the current global crisis we're facing from different perspectives of Wittgenstein's philosophy. It is organized by an international team of researchers from Japan, China, and Germany. And here you can find uh, the organizer here at the at top of the participant list as co-hosts, uh, Sao Li, Hai Chang, Danka, and also David who couldn't be here today. And we hope that the discussion we have at this workshop can help us understand what the problems really are and what can we do to make things better. And today's session will last for two hours in total. It will consist of a talk for 45 minutes, followed by a 15 minute comment and then a general discussion. So, and now I'm really excited to introduce today's speaker, Professor Hans Luga, and who is not only a distinguished Wittgenstein scholar, but also has broad philosophic interest include political philosophy, ethics, and recent European philosophy. He published books and articles on Frege, um, Heidegger, Wittgenstein, Foucault, and also Nietzsche. Today, he will give us a talk in exploring liberation in Wittgenstein's thought and consider it in relation to the liberation in Schopenhauer and Foucault. Also, we're glad to have Professor Jiang Yi, um, to be the commentator of this talk. Professor Jiang is a chair professor of the Ch Changjiang Scholar Program at Shanxi University. He works mainly in the history of analytic philosophy, philosophy of language, Wittgenstein, and recently the philosophy of artificial intelligence. So now please join me in welcome Professor Sluga. So I'm not muted, I take it. <laughs> You can hear me, yeah. Okay, I have a PowerPoint file. Can you see that PowerPoint? There we go. Okay, that's it. Great. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Oh, I have some 40 slides. I will talk around them um, and sometimes quote from them. So I'm happy to be here. I thought, what could I possibly contribute to a discussion of the relevance of Wittgenstein to our present situation? And uh, I want to talk about the notion, the idea of liberation. Um, so most famously, of course, expressed in this metaphor of the fly uh, and the fly bottle. And I was stimulated uh, to do this talk here, which is very experimental. I'm exploring this field, which is very large, uh, by reading a manuscript by Rupert Reed um, on Wittgenstein as a liberatory thinker. Uh, and I want to say, maybe a couple of things about uh, Rupert first uh, before, let me see how I get there. Next uh, slideshow, down there. Okay, hold on, there we are. Uh, I want to say a, a word about Rupert. So he's an English philosopher teaching at the University of East Anglia, Norwich, England. He has uh, long worked on Wittgenstein uh, he was a student of um, uh, Gordon Baker's and then a graduate student in America working with uh, Cora Diamond, and, uh, James Conant and Stanley Cavell. Uh, so he's been thinking along that way of looking at Wittgenstein for a long time. Uh, Rupert is also a Green Party activist. He has been very engaged in politics and political affairs and most recently has been a spokesman for the Extinction Rebellion a movement, so an environmental, strong environmental cause. 
Um, he has been the editor of a book with Alice Creary called The New Wittgenstein, which among other things, uh, tried to reflect on this question, what does Wittgenstein possibly contribute to thinking about political matters? So I see uh, three things there in, in Rupert. There is this concern with the new Wittgenstein, and there is a concern with politics there, and there is a concern with environmentalism. Um, and the question for me is, how is this connected? How are these issues, these political issues, connected for him with his account of Wittgenstein, Wittgenstein as a liberatory thinker? So the book I'm talking about is not published yet. It's supposed to come out uh, later this year. Uh, there is a talk Rupert gave here in Berkeley um, some while ago, 2019, and you can access it. There you have uh, a link to it if you want to have a look at that. Um, okay. Um, so uh, it's, it's too early, of course, for me to do a review here, an assessment of uh, this book because nobody has read it yet or very few people have seen it. So my goal is quite modest here. I want to explore this theme of liberation and sometimes talk about aspects of this treatment of liberation that uh, Reed provides with, with. I want to look more specifically at this metaphor of the fly or the fly bottle. I want to contrast Reed's Kantian reading of uh, the idea of liberation with uh, one that uh, draws on Schopenhauer. And I finally also want to look at um, the idea of liberation in Foucault in relation to Wittgenstein, because Reed again uh, refers in passing to Foucault in that context. So uh, four, four topics, and the first one is liberation in, in Wittgenstein. So Rupert is uh, mostly concerned, or is almost exclusively concerned with the Wittgenstein of the philosophical investigations. That's where he finds uh, this liberationist or liberatory form of thinking uh, that he's interested in. But I think that we need to go back much further and see that this theme of liberation is uh, one which concerned Wittgenstein from the period of the First World War onwards, and that he looked at this idea of liberation or thought about this idea in a number of different ways as his thinking developed. And the first, very first reference I find to the idea of liberation is uh, in the secret wartime diary, the Geheime Tagebücher, uh, right early in the war, September 12th, so he has been a soldier for something like a month, and he's already disenchanted and he has been reading Tolstoy and he has come across this sentence in Tolstoy that has impressed him very deeply, which he keeps repeating a number of times in the diary. Man is powerless in the flesh, but free through the spirit. And when one reads the diary with that sentence in mind, you begin to realize that this is really the theme that goes through that same, pro that, that whole private secret wartime diary. He is very much concerned with uh, this um, uh, being dominated by being uh, made powerless, uh, overpowered by the flesh. Uh, he worries about uh, masturbation, for instance. He worries about his life as a soldier. And he thinks his one escape is a spiritual one. He's, he has to become completely detached from his own um, f situation, from his corporal situation, and become pure spirit and think about himself as spirit. And that is his liberation. Uh, so here there is this idea of spiritual liberation that appears right there in 1914. But I want to point out that in this diary, at the same time, uh, there is also a second theme, namely a, a theme of intellectual liberation uh, that is just as important. And he speaks about this uh, uh, obsession he has, this concern he has, that he cannot yet say what he really wants to say philosophically. And he is looking, he says repeatedly, for the redeeming word. Uh, the German is erlösen, which has a connotation as well of liberation. Uh, you, you are redeemed, for instance, erlöst from a disease. Uh, uh, which has struck you and has kept you under its wings for a long time. Um, 
so intellectual uh, redemption as well, or relief or liberation. I think that's a second theme. Here. And we can see that uh, intellectual theme here expressed in the uh, secret diary here in a quote, for instance, in which he writes, once again, no clarity of vision, despite the fact that I'm obviously standing before the solution of the deepest problems so that I'm almost run into them with my nose. My spirit is right now simply blind for this. I feel that I'm standing right at the gate, but can't see it clearly enough to open it. So here we have this metaphor of the opening of the gate that is called for, that is needed in order to get him to see clearly what he wants to say. And when we look at the notebooks, 1914, 16, these um, philosophical remarks from the same period, we see that what he's engaged in at this point is thinking about uh, logical atomism. He's thinking in particular about this question, how we can determine the nature of logically simple objects. That's the, the problem with that for which he, which he can't clear, clearly see as yet and for which he looks for redemption, he wants to be redeemed and be able to say what it is. So I want to argue at this point that what he is looking for is a philosophical theory. I mean, it's the uh, justification of an understanding of the nature of logical atomism and the nature of these simple objects that constitute the world. But um, there is a change, of course. We are used to thinking about uh, uh, Wittgenstein, who is a skeptic about, he is questioning the possibility of metaphysics. We know that turn has occurred in the uh, Tractatus. But I want to say there is an earlier Wittgenstein, a metaphysical Wittgenstein, who uh, identifies very largely with uh, Russell's project, metaphysical project of this constituting a new kind of metaphysics, and that he adheres to this, certainly to the beginning of the First World War, but I want to say till around 1916. And that the third uh, of these diaries from 1916 uh, kind of fixes this moment at which he is turning away from metaphysics, turning away from Russell, and where he had previously looked for a liberation through the ca right kind of philosophical theorizing, the right kind of theory, uh, liberation now becomes for him uh, liberation from philosophical theorizing. That's I want to call the Pironian turn. Uh, and that is reflected at the end of the Tractatus where we are called to overcome the propositions of philosophy. And he introduces at this point this metaphor of throwing away of a ladder, which he has borrowed uh, directly from Fritz Mautner, presumably, but uh, in, indirectly from Sixtus Empiricus, the Pyrrhonian skeptic. And so I, that's why I call that turn in Wittgenstein the Pyrrhonian one. So my propositions are elucidatory in this way. The propositions of philosophy of metaphysics are elucidatory in this way. He who understands me finally recognizes them as senseless. He must, so to speak, throw away the ladder. He must overcome these propositions. So we already are dealing here with three kinds of liberation, right, in Wittgenstein. There is firstly that spiritual liberation uh, that he connects with uh, this idea from Tolstoy. There is the intellectual liberation that makes him capable of understanding uh, the, what is the content, the meaning of uh, logical atomism. And now there is that liberation that involves a turning away from philosophical theory altogether. So I make a big jump here and uh, turn here now to first consideration of this metaphor, most famously metaphor, liberating metaphor in Wittgenstein maybe, Philosophical Investigation 309. What is your aim in philosophy to show the fly, fly the way out of the fly bottle? And there are a number of variants to this and one of them we find in the Malcolm memoir. Uh, people haven't paid much attention to that in connection with the fly bottle. A person caught in a philosophical confusion is like a man in a room who wants to get out but doesn't know how. He tries the window, but it is too high. He tries the chimney, but it is too narrow. 
and if we would only turn around, he would see that the door has been opened all the time. So we've been trapped in the room and we don't see how to escape from it when there is indeed the possibility of escape. And that is indeed exactly the situation of the fly in the fly bottle as well, of course. So, so two ways of putting that same thought uh, that Wittgenstein formulates here. Well, uh, we might want to ask ourselves, why is he here so preoccupied with this idea of liberation? And I want to say there are certainly psychological factors that contribute to this and factors that have to do with his own anxieties, um, uh, particularly also uh, related to, to his own sexual anxieties. And uh, in uh, another diary from 1932, which we have under this title, Denkbewegungen, Movements of Thought, he describes, among other things, a dream here, which has to do with entrapment and liberation once again. I was sitting on a chair, almost like a criminal in the electric chair. The wires were coming towards me and then to the wall. I seemed to be enveloped by them and by ropes. And now I saw that I wasn't fettered at all. The wires were draped in bows around me. They were not fastened anywhere else. Immediately after awakening, I interpreted the dream as a simile, which I needed for my relation with Marguerite. Namely, it only looks as if I was bound to her by a thousand ropes. In reality, these ropes only dangle around me. Uh, so again, this idea of being tied down and then suddenly being freed by them and here connected with this uneasy relationship with he, he has uh, with this woman Marguerite at this point. He feels tied to her, but he is really free uh, to define his own relation to her as he wants or needs to. And uh, in that same diary, there are a number of different uh, dreams that he reports and each one of them has to do with this theme of liberation from something, liberation from anxiety of some form or other, liberation from the fear of death. Uh, so in one of these dreams he, he hears a voice um, which says the debt, whatever that is, must still be paid. And awakening from the dream, he finds himself in terror, he says, and he does what he has always done since childhood, he adds, namely he hides his head underneath the blanket and dares to free it only after some minutes. So again, the idea of freeing himself from the blanket that is constraining him, that is protecting him from this demand of the payment of uh, undefined debt. And uh, in another uh, dream, which seems at first so nonsensical to him, which has to do with the pronunciation of a word, he suddenly begins to realize when he wakes up that this has to do with the issue of racial mixture. And of course, you have to remember this is now the early 1930s here. He is very much preoccupied with this question of his own Jewishness. And so racial mixture is an anxiety producing thought. And this dream has to do with this question of being caught in this anxiety and how to free himself from it. And, and the fourth dream has to do with finding himself in a gondola and uh, there is another gondola next to it which is on fire and he fears that he is drifting, this gondola is drifting into this uh, burning second gondola. He is going, there's going to be a big explosion, a fire and uh, he will die and it's the fear of death that catches him and he breaks up out of the dream and he can finally liberate himself from this anxiety, right? So, so in each of them, there are these psychological considerations, namely anxiety and liberation from it uh, that preoccupy it. Um, and now I don't want to particularly focus on this psychological side of it. I want to look at the philosophical aspect of this uh, theme of liberation and want to look at the fly bottle in particular uh, uh, as exemplifying that. So uh, my next theme then part two is uh, the fly uh, in the fly bottle. And my question is what exactly does that metaphor come to? And, and here is a picture of a fly bottle. I don't know whether anybody ever has seen one. There are modern versions of it that don't look like this, but this is presumably the kind that uh, Wittgenstein was familiar with. 
So it was invented in the Victorian age, a device for catching flies. And so how does it work, right? So the fly is open at the top, as you can see, and you can fill it with a sugary solution, uh, which is there at the bottom of uh, the uh, uh, of the container. And uh, the fly bottle is open now um, at the bottom uh, and it sits on these three feet. So the fly can actually enter from below and go into the bottle and reach uh, the sugar solution, this bait, uh, and thereby get it uh, what it is looking for. Uh, but uh, having drunk from the sugar solution, the fly wants to escape now, but flies always fly forward. They fly towards the light so the fly flies upwards and it flies into the glass, it flies back again, it flies again and again into the glass until it gets exhausted and it drops into the sugary bait and it drowns and it dies. That's the way the fly bottle works, right? So I think each one of these elements are of relevance for understanding what Wittgenstein is driving at. We really have to understand this particular mechanism here. The first thing is that if the fly had only been able to retrace its steps, then it could have escaped. Uh, as in the other metaphor that Wittgenstein has of the man in the room, if the man had only looked backwards to the door through which he had entered, he would have seen that it was still open. So in some sense, the trap isn't the trap at all. One can escape from it, right? The problem of the fly is that it always wants to fly forward rather than fly backwards. If only it could be taught to fly backwards, it would be saved. And uh, I connect this with uh, the preceding remark in the Philosophical Investigation 308, where Wittgenstein says, how does the philosophical problem about mental processes and states and about behaviorism arise? The first step is the one that altogether escapes notice. So um, the fly isn't aware that it needs to get back to this first step, which seemed to be so harmless when it first got into the trap. So, so a number of questions here. And the first one is, what is the trap according to 308? So if 309 is a metaphor uh, for what he has told us in 308, so what is the trap, a trap of? And I take it that it is uh, to look at the mind or consciousness as an object, right? Uh, he doesn't put it quite that way at this point, but what he says is in 308 is, we talk of mental processes and states and leave their nature undecided because they are there objectively waiting to be discovered by us. Sometimes perhaps we shall know more about them for we have a definite concept of what it means to learn to know a process better, right? Um, and so, um, yes, we have a certain picture of the mind that is a trap that leads us to a completely wrong way of thinking about consciousness and about ourselves as well. So what is the bait that gets us there? And the answer has to be, it is a certain misunderstanding of the working of language, of the way we think about processes and states here. Um, here in particular, I think it is the referential conception of meaning. We're going back to the blue book, first page, a substantive makes us look for a thing that corresponds to it. So the substantive, the mind, consciousness, the soul, or whatever words we use. And Wittgenstein is very free in using these very different alternative terms here. Uh, the substantive makes us look for, uh, the substantive uh, makes us look for a thing that corresponds to it. That is what lures us into a certain way of thinking about the mind uh, that is so deeply mistaken. The question is, of course, why is the fly attracted to the sugar, right? And the answer is, well, it likes the sugar, or it needs the sugar, the sugar is food for it. Uh, so why are we uh, attracted to the referential conception of meaning? And I find there is some, not very much that Wittgenstein tells us about it. He says, we are attracted to this way of thinking, uh, but why is that so? Uh, of course, there are some um, uh, writers who have argued that this is 
the case only in some languages, particularly in the European languages. Uh, Nietzsche uh, once spoke in this way, and of course we know this idea um, that this is only a contingent feature of human languages as the Sapir-Whorf hypothesis. These two uh, anthropologists or linguists who conjectured that American Indian languages uh, typically lack substantives, right? And so uh, if that is the case, then it seems that it's only a contingent feature about us and our languages uh, that provides us with this bait of thinking about uh, the mind in this particular way. I want to say that this may not be enough and that Wittgenstein is giving us here too limited uh, a story to explain why we tend to think in this uh, uh, substantival way about uh, consciousness, the mind, and the self. Um, I, I want to argue maybe that there is a way in which uh, that thought that uh, we are not only physical objects in a physical sense, but objects in a, in a mental sense, uh, comes from this very strong sense that we have of the dead, that the dead seem to be present to us in some ways very often. They haunt us. Um, we feel them to be still with us. Um, or we dream of them. They speak to us in dreams. Uh, and that it is this presence uh, of the dead, not in their bodily form, but in their form as thinking, speaking, thinking, feeling subject, that they seem to us present as full realities as objectified. And it's maybe that is also part of the bait that makes us think about uh, ourselves, about the self in, in this particular manner. Uh, so question number four for me is how are we trapped, right? Uh, in some sense, the, the door is open, the bottle is open at the, at the bottom. So, so why are we trapped or how are we trapped uh, when we are trapped in this particular way of thinking? And the metaphor of the fly bottle suggests it's our always moving, wanting to move forward uh, instead of retracing our steps. And here's a remark from the 1930s, of course, uh, culture and value. Our civilization is characterized by the word progress. Typically, it constructs, it is occupied with building an ever more complicated structure. So we could say uh, we see Certain, we have certain questions, we see certain problems about the nature of mental states, and we try to resolve these by constructing a theory. We find the theory is insufficient. We construct a more complex theory. We move forward and forward in our theorizing to more and more sophisticated and complex theories. None of them ever prove satisfactory. Uh, what we should have learned instead is to retrace the steps by which we got into the original question to begin with. So what does the fly represent in the metaphor? That's another question I uh, was uh, entertaining in my mind, right? Uh, it seems to me that this is a particularly difficult question to answer. Uh, flies are a nuisance, right? And a possible carrier of disease. And that's why we have traps to get rid of them. That's why we have the fly bottle. So why then does Wittgenstein want to liberate the fly, right? What does it, uh, uh, the trapped fly represent for him? And uh, one might go back here to a personal explanation and say, well, look, I mean, the fly bottle is not a very pleasant way of uh, killing flies. You can see it uh, struggling there again and again to try to get out and it doesn't succeed till it finally drowns. And so I assume that the young Wittgenstein must have seen these fly bottles and must have maybe been repelled by them. Because in Philosophical Investigations 284, we read that we cannot imagine pain in the lifeless stone, but now look at a wriggling fly and pain seems to be able to get a foothold here. So was it that he saw the pain in the wriggling fly that upset him, right? Um, well, of course, that only um, uh, explains something about the metaphor. Um, what I'm concerned about is this question, uh, why must the fly be liberated when it is entrapped? Or why must we be liberate, liberated uh, from our philosophical propositions? Why can't we just simply be left with them, right? Um, 
so um, we are liberated, it seems, in, in 301 from the Cartesian conception of the self, right? That's, that is what is at stake here. Uh, but the question is, of course, first, how did we ever get entrapped in this, right? This is a question which I don't know that Wittgenstein really fully addresses. And I'm saying here uh, on the slide that um, we often find that we first must convince our students of the Cartesian conception of the self and how plausible it is, right, that we, um, what Descartes offers us in his meditations. And then when we have familiarized our students with this philosophical view, then we disabuse them afterwards in Wittgensteinian terms. So we first must entrap the student in order to, to liberate them, right? And that seems a, a peculiar way of going about it, right? Um, so are we inevitably, as we as ordinary people, not necessarily philosophers, uh, necessarily entrapped in philosophical views? Are we necessarily entrapped in uh, the Cartesian view? Uh, and how did we get there, right? And why do we need to be liberated here? Um, uh, maybe we should say, yes, we need to think about philosophical problems in this very broad sense um, as that even ordinary people, non-philosophers, have philosophical commitments and beliefs. Uh, and they may not know anything about philosophy, but they still need to be liberated. Reed in his book writes about liberation from ideologies, not only from philosophies, strictly speaking. But then, of course, the question is, what is an ideology? Uh, I don't know what the answer is to that. Um, he also speaks about a liberation from ideologies to which we have an unwilled adherence. So maybe if we have a set of beliefs to which we have a willed adherence that we shouldn't necessarily want to, or can, couldn't be necessarily be liberated from that, uh, but uh, liberation from ideologies in which we have an unwilled ad adherence or ideas and assumptions which are not freely and openly understood, he also says. But then my question, of course, would still be uh, to what beliefs do we fully adhere willingly, right? Is our adherence to beliefs willing, always? And do we really have a free and open understanding of what we believe? Well, usually, I want to say not, right? Um, and so what, what are we, what do we need to be liberated from, right? And what can we be liberated from? Um, are these only philosophical propositions? Or are these much broader sets of propositions? And all that, I think, is not fully spelled out in Wittgenstein's metaphor. Well, so liberation from any, any case, right? So that's what's at stake in 309. Uh, and the context at least suggests that what Wittgenstein is thinking about above all is at this moment a Cartesian or substantival conception of the self. Um, and as I said, read things of this things of this liberation as in much broader terms. Sorry, I'm repeating something I've had on the previous page here. Um, but my question is here: um, Can we really speak of liberation from ideologies or beliefs? Uh, our assumptions? Is that a metaphor when we speak in this way? I mean, more typically we speak, and Wittgenstein we saw speaks of liberation from a psychological state, a fear, an anxiety, an obsession, a danger, or maybe more objectively from a form of domination. I can be liberated from domination. I can cease to be a slave, right? Or from, can be liberated from exploitation. Uh, Foucault writes about such things, right? And it seems to me that maybe when we talk about liberation from ideas, that is a derivative notion. Um, it's derivative in the sense that an idea can get us to be fearful or can make us fear anxieties or make us obsessive. Right? And we can be liberated from that obsession. But otherwise, when we speak about liberation from an idea or an ideology or belief, what we are really talking about is just giving up that ideology or giving up that belief, right? So, so I, to my example would be, we may be obsessed with the Cartesian conception of the self. And then when we abandon that, we then may feel liberated because our obsession has now gone away, right? 
but it could also be that I just hold the Cartesian view in a non-obsessive way, simply as one of several philosophical views and find having found this the most plausible one, I attend to it, but then I realize it's not plausible after all and abandon it without any sense of liberation. So I can give up ideas um, and feel liberated, but not about the idea, right? I feel liberated about something else connected with the idea, um, uh, or I can just abandon the idea and have no sense of liberation at all. So, so what is the object, uh, or what is the, the psychological state of the condition that would be better word to use here, uh, from which I am liberated? What does liberate refer to when I'm liberated from something? So in this context of 309, 308, uh, we are talking about liberation from um, uh, this Cartesian conception of the mind. Uh, but the question is, is 309 meant to formulate a general philosophical methodology? Is that's what uh, Wittgenstein doing uh, at that point. He, he's putting that aphorism before us without any condition, right? Without any qualification. But it is an aphorism, right? And aphorisms, I say here, are splinters of insight. They are not comprehensive theories. So should we take that one sentence to be a characterization of what Wittgenstein is doing everywhere in the investigations or everywhere in his work? And I'm skeptical about this because he is so skeptical about this very idea of there being a single method. So in Philosophical Investigations 133, he says, there is no single philosophical method, though there are indeed methods, different therapies, so to say, right? So why should we assume that uh, liberation, the liberating methodology is the methodology of the investigations or of Wittgenstein's philosophizing? Uh, and uh, uh, when we look at um, section 109 in the investigations, for instance, he says something quite different. He doesn't talk about liberation at all. We may not advance any kind of theory, so it's non-theoretical, right? There must not be anything hypothetical in our considerations. We must do away with all explanation and description alone must take its place. Or in 124, philosophy may in no way interfere with the actual use of language. It can in the end only describe it it leaves everything as it is. So description or describing is also another method uh, that Wittgenstein is talking about here. And these statements clearly refer back to things that Wittgenstein had talked about uh, in the 1930s, reported to us by the notes that Wittgenstein kept of Wittgenstein's, uh, more kept of Wittgenstein's lectures in this period, where Wittgenstein is saying he is concerned with establishing a kind of phenomenology, uh, namely a description of grammatical forms. Right? Uh, and so is that also meant to be liberatory? I have no conviction that this is so. It seems that he also entertains a very different form of methodology and appeals to that just as much in the investigations as he in, appeals to this idea of liberation. Okay, uh, let's move on to part three then. Um, so uh, Kant, uh, Reed is in fact aiming at giving us something like a Kantian interpretation of Wittgenstein. Um, and this may to some extent be due to his indebtedness to writers like Stanley Cavell um, and others. Uh, it's a radicalized Kantianism, but still Kantianism. Um, so where, when there is some reason to think that uh, there's something here in common between uh, Wittgenstein and Kant, of course. So I quote here uh, the remark from the preface to the Critic of Pure, Pure Reason that this work is supposed to have thought about the end of an endless era. And Wittgenstein, and the Rotatus, of course, saying that he has given uh, endgültige lösung solution of his philosophical problems, right? So there is a, there is a context here. You can see connection here. But uh, Wittgenstein uh, goes beyond Kant, it seems to me, in seeking to liberate, well, in fact, he is liberating us in 
seeking to liberate us in the Tractatus from all philosophical and theorizing, even, of course, from Kant's transcendental idealism. Uh, so in that sense, he is not a Kantian, a radicalized Kantian. But uh, Reed thinks in particular that Wittgenstein's liberatory philosophy, which he has identified there in the investigations, is, he says, ethically inflected, uh, and in fact, in the same way as Kant's philosophy. And he associates Wittgenstein's idea of liberation very specifically with Kant's notion of autonomy. He writes, I have two sentences here from his text. While my book implies a massive criticism of the individualism of Kant, it takes the promise of the concept of autonomy as central to its task. And the second is, I shall read Wittgenstein as realizing by transforming the crucial unfulfilled promise of Kantianism, that of autonomy. Right? So, and so liberation and autonomy are for Reed two conjoined uh, notions. And my question is to what extent um, that is the case. Now, Reed goes beyond the Kantian reading in that he says that Wittgenstein does not share Kant's individualism, uh, that Wittgenstein's liberatory philosophy is second personal or uh, that it is in the I-U mode, or I-U modes a focal, he says. Um, and he goes, in fact, a step further, further even. I mean, it's not only uh, is liberation an ethical undertaking, an interpersonal undertaking, it's a political undertaking. So liberation, in my conception, is therefore necessarily political. In this, I follow Michel Foucault. And that's where the first reference to Foucault in, Bre in Reed's book occurs. Um, and Reed takes the evidence for this uh, second personal IU modes uh, or, or even political reading of uh, Wittgenstein from the dialogical style of the philosophical investigations. But my question, of course, is how essential is that style of writing, right? It's certainly absent from many other of Wittgenstein's writings, not there in the Tractatus, it's not in the blue brown books, it's not in the notebooks from early and late. And even in the philosophical investigations, it's not everywhere present. It's not there in the programmatic statements, uh, 109 to 133, for instance, right? And the question is, what does the dialogical style even indicate, right? Does it indicate a a conversation between two parties at all. Um, I sometimes write in form of a question and give an answer. It's not meant to be a dialogue between two parties, right? I'm posing a problem and then try to say what that answer is. Um, uh, it seems to me that the dialogical structure serves different purposes in investigation. So sometimes it seems to be a dialogue between Wittgenstein and holding on to what and sometimes it's quite clear of what to do. So it has a whole range of uh, options here uh, to it. Um, I think, however, this um, reads attempt to associate um, um, the idea of liberation in Wittgenstein so closely with Kant is misleading that he would have done better to connect uh, Wittgenstein here with uh, the Schopenhauer of uh, the, will, uh, uh, the world as well and representation. Um, uh, so one could say, well, there are these two different ways of looking at liberation in Wittgenstein, Kantian one, Schopenhauerian one. The question is, which one is most closely reflected in Wittgenstein's thinking. Not that he would fully identify with either of these two worlds, of course. So um, uh, I went through the Prussian Academy edition of Kant and looked at the terms freedom and liberation. It turns out freedom is, of course, a term occurring frequently in Kant, 1,105 times, I found, whereas liberation only occurs 70 times. Right? So it's not a central notion. And when he does, when Kant does speak of liberation, he always means it in a very specific sense, namely as an overcoming of liberation from desires, sensuality, inclination, and even the will. And he, in one phrase he says, it's a liberation of the will from the despotism of the desires. 
Uh, and this is meant to be at the same time a liberation of reason, a liberation which makes us capable of being rational and therefore a liberation in order to obey the moral law. Right? So uh, to be liberated or to be enlightened means for Kant to be free in the use of one's reason so as to be able to act in accordance to the, with the universal principle of the categorical imperative. And to be free means to be autonomous, that is, to give oneself the moral law, in particular, the categorical imperative. Schopenhauer, on the other hand, thinks in very different terms. Uh, so he also uses the terms freedom and liberation, but he uses them very sparingly. In fact, a liberation occurs only five times in the world as will and representation. He does speak of the liberation of knowledge from the servitude of the will, and in another passage of the liberation of thought from all its shackles. And he particularly refers to Descartes as someone who had sought liberation from the assumptions of scholastic philosophy, but uh, uh, Schopenhauer adds that he soon found himself even more firmly bound by a new set of philosophical shackles, namely his own philosophical theories. Instead of speaking about liberation, Schopenhauer more generally speaks, uh, more radically speaks of the negation of the will. That's a phrase that occurs 179 times in, in, uh, in the world as well in representation. So the negation of the will. And the negation of the will is a form of liberation, namely it is meant to liberate us from everything, in particular also from the demands of reason, um, which reason being for Schopenhauer just one of the manifestations of the will. It's an aspect of the will. So the negation of the will is liberation from the world as a whole. And of course, also in passing liberation from the oppressive demands of the categorical imperative and more generally the moral law. So uh, uh, Schopenhauer is not somebody who wants to think about ethics in terms of uh, laws or principles or imperatives. He calls the categorical imperative, Kant's categorical imperative, childish. Um, and uh, the Tractatus uh, exhibits the same kind of disdain, it seems to me, for the idea of moral prescriptions or laws. So he follows in that respect Schopenhauer here. All propositions must be of equal value, hence also there can be no ethical propositions. The first thought in setting up an ethical law of the form thou shalt is, and what if I do not do it? Uh, so Wittgenstein's search for liberation is thus not a search for autonomy. Um, and I think this is also quite made quite clear in the lecture on ethics, uh, where uh, the, he states no moral imperatives, instead uh, seems to want to characterize ethics in terms of certain profound ethical sentiments and feeling and the, one of these fundamental experiences is uh, expressed in the contained in the proposition I'm guilty whatever I do right uh, whether I acted this way or that way whether I obey that this or that imperative uh, that's an ethical experience so it's not observance of a moral principle that finds defines one's status as an ethical being, but having the right attitude to oneself, to oneself in the world. So in all these respects, I think um, uh, Wittgenstein is more akin to uh, Schopenhauer than to Kant, and to Kant's notion of liberation, certainly in the period of the Tractatus, than to the Kantian notion of autonomy. Uh, so finally, in part four, let me turn to uh, Wittgenstein and Foucault. So I bring him up because Reed himself uh, mentions Foucault a number of times and sees some affinities here between uh, Foucault and Wittgenstein. So Foucault, we know, uh, took a critical take of 1960s, 70s style of liberationism. So what was called third world liberation, women's liberation, black liberation, sexual liberation, gay liberation, all of this, he looked at with a skeptical eye and said, what we need to ask are two essential questions. And the first one is, what are we meant to be liberated from? And the second one is, what are we liberated for? And both are absolutely equally important. So in 
uh, in a very late interview from 1984, Care of the Self as a Practice of Freedom, he says, I have always been somewhat suspicious of the notion of liberation. And he had expressed that very clearly already in the history of sexuality when he attacked Reich's doctrine of sexual liberation as illusory. Uh, there is no absolute liberation for, for him from constraints of social power. We are always within social networks. There's only a change of these constraints and their possible alleviation. And that's what we must aim for. And that's what practices of freedom are meant to aim at. So this is why I emphasize practices of freedom over processes of liberation. And Foucault explained his reluctance uh, uh, to talk about liberation in, in these words. One runs the risk of falling back on the idea that there exists a human nature or base that as a consequence of certain historical, economic and social processes has been concealed, alienated or imprisoned in and by mechanisms of repression. According to this hypothesis, all that is required is to break these repressive deadlocks uh, and man will be reconciled with himself, rediscover his nature or regain contact with his origin and re-establish a full and positive relation with himself. I think this idea should not be accepted without scrutiny. In fact, he didn't think it should be accepted at all. Uh, so with respect to sexual liberation, uh, he said, it is clear that a number of liberations were necessarily, were necessary vis-a-vis -vis male power, that liberation was necessary from an oppressive morality concerning heterosexuality as well as homosexuality. But this liberation does not give rise to the happy human being. Liberation paves the way for new power relations, which must be controlled by practices of freedom. And the same thing is, he said was true of politics. Uh, so uh, liberation for political domination, for instance, of the um, uh, previously colonized states of the world was indeed necessary, but the question was still what should be done afterwards when liberation has been achieved, right? And that is uh, what practices of freedom need to concern themselves with. So to say that we are nat by nature free and the liberation is necessary to restore us to this original freedom means in fact to fall back uh, on an objectified conception of the human self, which Foucault uh, is as keen to avoid as Wittgenstein. Uh, so both of them reject the Cartesian substantival conception of the self. And uh, Foucault is as critical of the Kantian autonomous subject uh, uh, as well as the Cartesian one, and also of the Sartrean authentic subject. So substantival subject, autonomous subject, authentic subject, all are uh, to be rejected. Um, well, where Wittgenstein may have got this idea of liberation from Schopenhauer, to some extent maybe from Tolstoy, uh, Foucault, of course, derived his from Nietzsche, and in particular from the gay science, which is a deeply liberatory book. Read it again and you find that's what Nietzsche is actually talking about. I'm speculating about this possibility that Nietzsche, that Nietzsche also directly influenced Wittgenstein. There is, nobody has really paid attention to these links about uh, between Nietzsche and Wittgenstein, but they are there uh, to be found. So Nietzsche writes in that book of the need to look at European thought and morality in a new way. But in order to achieve that goal, he says, one must have liberated oneself from many things that oppress, inhabit, hold down, and make heavy precisely as Europeans today. The human being of such a beyond who wants to behold the supreme measures of value of his time must first of all overcome, überwinden this time in himself. Interesting enough, this term that is to be found in Schopenhauer, certainly at these crucial moments, but also, of course, in the last sentence of the Tractatus occurs also here in the Gay Science. And uh, Nietzsche also writes, the ability to con con contradict the attainment of a good conscience when it feels hostile to what is accustomed, traditional and hallowed, this is the step of steps of the liberated spirit. So for me, the question is then, to what extent should be associated Wittgenstein's way of thinking about liberation, not only with Schopenhauer, but also maybe more directly with Nietzsche. 
But applying uh, Foucault's considerations to Wittgenstein and to Reed's reading of Wittgenstein, Reed's account of Wittgenstein, I still want to get back finally to this question. What is this dual question? What is Wittgenstein's philosophy meant to liberate us from? That is what we really need to get clearer about. But the second one, more difficult to deal with, is what does it, is it meant to liberate us for? What is it, what, where are we supposed to be at the end when we are liberated, right? Um, uh, it appears to me that uh, neither Reed nor Wittgenstein in the way that he's interpreted by Read, gives us uh, an answer to that second question. Uh, we seem to be stuck uh, with a negative conception of freedom, freedom from, right? And this is a conception which is largely characteristic of modern liberalism, as, as I have been, has argued anyway. Uh, so should we then say that Reed and possibly Wittgenstein, as Reed sees him, remain stuck in a liberal understanding of freedom where freedom from is the end of the process of liberation, right? Is freedom itself uh, the goal of the liberating process? Uh, now Berlin, of course, said that the positive conception of freedom was typical for conservatism, but it seems to me that is uh, too quick. It holds only if one assumes that this positive goal is fixed and given, it's there once and for all. Uh, that certainly wasn't Foucault's ways of thinking. Uh, so one might say if one thinks of the, the need for determining positive goals of liberation uh, as Foucault sought to establish them in his practices of freedom, uh, then this freedom for is not a conservative in character. It's itself a liberating uh, phenomenon. And, and that's how I would like uh, to see it. So liberation is certainly a theme uh, in Wittgenstein. It is a theme in both Wittgenstein and Foucault. Um, uh, but I think that I want to resist the idea that we can capture everything that they say in terms of that single concept. I think that both of them were not static thinkers. Uh, and there is not a single concern that uh, can encapsulate uh, everything they stand for. So for me, there is a metaphysical Wittgenstein the one from 1911 to 1914 or 16. There was an empty metaphysical Wittgenstein. There was a Pironian skeptic in Wittgenstein. There's an anti-skeptical thinker, of course, also in Wittgenstein. There's a phenomenological Wittgenstein. There's a therapeutic Wittgenstein. Yes, and there is also a liberatory one that uh, Reed has put emphasis on and that deserves credit, of course. Uh, so I want to think at the end of both Foucault and Wittgenstein as experimental thinkers, experimenting with different forms of thought. <laughs> There's a wonderful passage from Foucault in an interview with the Italian writer Duccio Trombadori, where he says, I'm an experimenter and not a theorist. I call a theorist someone who constructs a general system, either deductive or analytical, and applies it to different fields in a uniform way. That isn't my case. I'm an experimenter in the sense that I write to change myself and in order not to think the same thing as before. I like that passage so much because I think every word of it could have been written by Wittgenstein also. Um, and uh, I want to refer here to a passage from by Friedrich Weismann from the 1930s that uh, points in that direction where Weismann says that he has, Wittgenstein has the wonderful gift of, of always seeing things, seeing things as if for the first time. He always follows the inspiration of the moment and tears down what he has previously sketched out. And so finally then, my last slide, uh, some closing thoughts. So to be liberated means to be willing to experiment, I think, with different philosophical methods, different ways of philosophical systems, uh, uh, ideas, and to resist the idea that the practice of philosophy can be captured in a single term, whatever that is, uh, whether it be uh, liberatory or something else. Uh, to be liberated is to be free of the obsession with freedom as well. Uh, so to always think only in terms of freedom and the pursuit, pursuit of freedom, that's what our modern liberal culture has taught us to do. That is not to be liberated. Uh, we have to understand that there are other and perhaps more comprehensive values. And I want to pick out two of them, maybe survival 
and flourishing. I want to say, if we take read seriously with his concern with environmental, and we don't can't find this in ascribing to Wittgenstein a, a concern with negative freedom uh, in his thinking about liberation. We have to think about a thinking that goes but beyond the thinking on freedom and concern itself also with these fundamental questions of survival and flourishing. Uh, number four, to be liberated is to be free from the attachment to any one thinker and to any single way of reading their words. I would never want to be a Wittgensteinian myself. I want to be a free thinker, like I think Wittgenstein himself was, and Nietzsche certainly too. Uh, and we will have to see whether Reed's treatment of Wittgenstein can provide us with this kind of liberation. Thank you. Thank you so much for Professor Slugas' inspiring talk. And now, uh, could I invite Professor Jiang to give his comment on Professor Slugas' talk? Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Professor uh, Hans Slugas. Uh, thank you, uh, Zeng Wei, to invite me uh, to be uh, respond to Slugas' talk. And uh, I think I actually so this uh, is a very uh, inspired talk and a very good topic for us to understand in uh, philosophy in different ways. Uh, I think the Professor uh, Robert Reed should be the, the best person to respond to your talk just because you gave a talk to him. Um, uh, but actually, sir, uh, I read his talks in advance, and also I uh, listened to your talk, uh, the, the order of, uh, 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 from your uh, PBTs, uh, PowerPoints, and uh, I found something very fresher, a lot of things I read before. So I would like to give my uh, point point here. Uh, Do you see? Yes. Yeah? Yes. Okay. Yeah, so. Yeah, so the first questions I want to ask about uh, uh, Hans Gustav is the meaning of liberation in Wittgenstein and other philosophers. So I, I just want to make it clear uh, what a distinction of liberation and freedom. So I I didn't mention I didn't pay mention to attention to the implications of uh, implicate of freedom in Wittgenstein and other philosophers before, but after I uh, listened to but after I listened to Ken's talk, so I realized that I should put the uh, consideration of the difference of liberation and freedom put in here. So the first of all, I want to ask the, what kind of liberation in Wittgenstein philosophy? Uh, Suga ha have, has, has give, uh, given us uh, some different understanding of liberation from Different, uh, different perspectives uh, by different philosophers, just like Kant, Zubenhor, or the others. But I want to give the other examples about how could we understand the, the concept of liberation from William James. So I list some different understandings of the concept of liberation in different philosophers, including Wittgenstein's in different periods. So the first thing is about uh, uh, diminishing of philosophy from discussed language in his early philosophy. 
So as we know, active interpreters big extent dismissed the all philosophical problems by analyzing our language in logical analysis. So actually we can find he wants to uh, put all the philosophical problems in one sentence. That is, we can look at philo philosophy in the very bright way. That means we can look at the very logical language which provide us with some propositional structures. But, but, and, but finally, you know, in the night after 1930s, Wittgenstein gave us the other understanding of liberation as a description of usage of language in our ordinary life, ordinary life. So we can find even in Wittgenstein's philosophy, we can find different perspectives of understanding of liberation. And also we can find some other understanding of liberation in different philosophers, such as Kant, Schopenhauer, and William James. So Hans Luger has given us very clear interpretation of the understanding of the concept of the liberation in Kant and Schubert. Here, I just want to mention that question about how to understand the concept of liberation from William James philosophy. So James also talk about our language when he making when he making uh, m making the, some ideas about how to understand how to understand our experience in our life. So here I call two passages from his uh, 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 one passage from his principle of psychology. So as he said, there is no conjunction of preposition and holiday and and the virtual and the verb phrase, synthetic form or inflection of voice in human speech that does not express some shedding on other relation, which we at the moment actually fails to exist between the large object of a thought. If we speak objectively, it is the real relation that appear revealed. If we speak subjectively, it is a stream of consciousness that it matches each of them by the inward coloring of its own. In either case, the relation are numberless and non-existing language is capable of doing justice to all this shadow. So William Gave, William Given, in his book, he mentioned he mentioned that the William James idea on language that in this passage I quote, language simply cannot grasp the transitive parts. It either overlooks them or it substantialized them. In either case, they are not recognized as such. This realization leads James and time to reject language. Language is the most impact and impassive, expensive means yet discovered for communicating thought. So we can find in this way, we can find in lot the oh sorry. We can find in Jim Williams' understanding of liberation, if we can say he abandon abandoning of abstract terms from our stream of consciousness of course also from our ordinary la ordinary language right now next i just want to ask 
three questions about the liberatory reading of Wittgenstein philosophy by Robert Reed. So, and also uh, two uh, hands. So, one is about philosophical or metaphysical preparations with preparations from common sense. So, what the purpose of Wittgenstein to make such a distinction? As we know, in tractators, Wittgenstein gave us some metaphysical preparations. Of course, he, he didn't admit such a complaint that he did not give us any metaphysical things. But according to our analysis, we can find some preparations from his book, Metaphysical. So how could we say this metaphysical preparations could be the topic in his, in his tractators. And the other one is about the preparations from common sense. How could we do with, how could we do with his preparations in his investigations? So th there is a, some distinction between two preparations philosophical preparations and common sense preparations. And which one would be, would be, would be the aim or purpose of Big Stan to make such a distinction? The second question is about, so we can find his tractatus would be read by read in ethical way. Uh, some people would say he gave us some ethical ideas in tractators. But, but also some people ask whether we can read tractators in this way as mathematical way. So I just want to ask how on what level for Big Sen to consider his work as ethical? So this is question. The third question is about two styles, two styles of writing for Big Sen. So just as Hans mentioned, he gave us a, a dialogical way to present his ideas or on other ideas or by a phrasistic way to present his ideas. But how could we compare the two ways together to consider his different styles of writings? And the next question is about why Shubin Ho rather than Kent so I agreed with Hans on his talk about Shubin Ho give us much similarities with Wittgenstein's understanding of liberation in his book. And also Hans gave us some examples of how could we dismiss the Kantinian understanding of liberation. Not liberation, but freedom in Kantinian way. So here, I just want to ask what difference between Shubin Ho and Kant in the liberation reading? So we can find passage from Shubin Ho on liberation of cognition, as Hans mentioned in Schubert Hall, the world as real and the representation. I hope that all these remarks have invested me to make clear the nature of subjective condition for aesthetic pleasure and how great a role this subjective condition plays in the pleasure itself namely liberation of connection, cognition from service to the will.
forgetting one's oneself as an individual and the elevation of consciousness to the pure willingness, timeless subject of cognition, independent of all relation, relations. So we can find in this way, Xiu Benhua talk about liberation just the, from the aesthetic, aesthetic, aesthetic way, rather than from cognitive way. And also from his book, we can find some passage very interesting relating to our topic. For the most part, cognition always remains subordinated to the service of the will, as it in fact develops in its service, and indeed spread from the will as a head to spring from the top a trunk of the body. With animals, this servitude of cognition to the will can never be overcome. With human beings, such as overcoming appearance only as an exception, as we will now be considering more closely. So here we can find he used overcoming or overcome the term which was used many times in Kant and other philosophers. Also, he mentioned that we find that the peace and the blissfulness we have described in the lives of saintly people is only the flower that emerges from the constant overcoming of the will. And we see the constant struggle with the will to, to life as the soil from which it rests on earth. Nobody can have lasting peace. So we can find from Sobin Hua he gave us some way of overcoming of will to peace or to the lightest peace. Of course, nobody could do that, but he preferred to give us such a purpose or aim of such overcoming of will. And also, I have other questions about why Zubin Hoa, rather than Kent, if Wittgenstein read Kent through Zubin Hoa, as Hans mentioned. So actually, so he didn't, actually, he didn't mention this point in his talk today. But we know Wittgenstein knew Kent just uh, through, just uh, through Schubert Hall or the other newer conditions. So if we know how Wittgenstein understand, understood Kant, so we can, we can know how Wittgenstein, how understood, understood Schubert Hall. In Kant, maybe we can find that there's no concept of liberation and uh, overcoming as has mentioned. So he prefers Schubert Hall rather to Kant. So, but actually in Kant, he also gave us some descriptions or some uh, 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 explanation about how to liberate from, so especially in his practical reason. So from his first critic, we can find some passages or sentences about his talking about liberation. So he said the moral law and with its practical reason come in and force this concept freedom of us. So we can find, we can use our moral law to talk about our freedom 
So the freedom, the concept of freedom was, was established, was established under moral law. And also he gave us the other mention about consciousness of this fundamental law, maybe called a fact of reason, because one cannot reason it out from antecedent data of reason. So the fundamental law, as Hans has, has mentioned in his talk, is that is uh, the categorical imperative. So we can find such a fundamental law has the authority to determine our cause, our understanding of freedom. So, so next I would like to talk about the meaning of a phrase of flight bottle. As Hans mentioned, I agree with Hans' analysis and analysis of this uh, fly bottle uh, model, uh, metaphor. But I also want to ask some question about that. So, how could we escape from temptation of the bait, or in which way? So that is a question for Hans. And also the second question is about, is there referential conception of meaning the only bait for us to be trapped? As has mentioned that he consider, he considered the referential conception of meaning is the key to, is a key to understanding, to understanding Wittgenstein's Wittgenstein's description of fly bottle. So I just want to ask whether there is only way, there's the only way as a referential concept of meaning to be, to be the bad for us. So how about the identity of the two words by which one defines one with the other? So this is the other way. Also from investigations we can find from section 254, he said the substitution of identical or the same, for example, is an other typical expansion in philosophy as if we were talking about the shadow of meaning and all that are in question were to find words to hit on the correct net uh, announcing. And that in question, that is in question in philosophy, only where we have to give the psychologically accurate account of the temptation to use a particular mode of expression. What we are tempted to see in such a case is of course not philosophy, but it is it's raw, it's raw material. So for example, what a mathematician, mathematician is inclined to say about the objectivity and the reality of mathematical facts is not a philosophy of metaphysics, mathematics, but something for philosophical, philosophical treatment. So we can find this way just means Wittgenstein gave us many ways to define our temptation to be trapped, to be trapped in the bottle flying, as he said. So the philosopher treats a question like illness. So this is a conclusion about that. And also about, about the section 293 in investigations, we can find his famous metaphor of beetle box. In this metaphor, actually Wittgenstein wants to clarify the object is irrelative in consideration of the mode of expression, namely object and the name, that's the correspondence of the two terms. But 
it is not concerned with the referential conception of meaning, enhanced understanding. So I don't think there is the corresponding of object and the name, but only, but only in which extent the object is irrelevant in our consideration of the mode of expression. The next question is about from what we liberate and whose liberation in Wittgenstein philosophy. As you know, we had some, we have had some, we have had some conception of liberation politically and ideologically. So sometimes when we talk about liberation, we would think of, we, we, we would think of something uh, 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 liberated from, just, just like we liberate people from impressive and we liberate people uh, from some fails such as, but we liberate people from, what means we do that? But I, I'm not sure, I'm not sure. The first question is about what it is what it is the bait for us to liberate. So that means liberation from confusion or from temptation. I, I'm not sure there's just a question about that. So is that a, a deliberate choice? Or when we talk about liberation from or freedom from, so actually I just want to make clear about the distinction of liberation and freedom. For me, the liberation should be understood as an intentional act, but freedom, autonomous. So we can find, we can find the two different way of understanding of the two terms. So I'm not sure, for, for example, uh, Hans give us uh, some uh, example, uh, examples of the understanding of liberation in different perspectives. But, but when we talk about liberation, could we say that we have a power to liberate some people, somebody from something? But if we talk about freedom, that means we have the right to, to be free from something. So I don't think the two terms have the same perspective or same meaning in this sense. Of course, we can talk about liberation and freedom in political or in the moral way. But I'm, I'm not sure whether we can took them as the same in political or in the moral. So how could we consider for cause political significance when he talk about liberation? So I'd say, yes, for cause has very strong implication in his talking about liberation. But that is a political way rather than philosophical way. So how could we talk about liberation in a philosophical way? The next question is about who liberated philosophy from something. I, I asked this, this question to Hans before. So we discussed this question Sometimes, I'm, I'm not sure the philosophers or someone else who liberated for philosophers. So who did or who do liberate liberation from? Finally, I would like to ask such a question about how many Wittgenstein in our understanding. So uh, 
we can find the different names for Wittgenstein. So metaphysical or ultimate physical or a pyrony or a descriptive or phenomenologist or liberationist, even experimental. So of course we can give them to give give them give give the all the names to Wittgenstein diff, just the diff, from different perspectives. But in my understanding, so I would like to see that Wittgenstein philosophy might be might be seen as escaped from. That's different from liberation is or experimental. But escape just means no way we couldn't have, we couldn't have in at once. We just want to escape from something. So this escaped from in two senses. One from any philosophical temptation, the other from any attempt to label his philosophy under a single name. So if we could, we could have such concept understanding of liberation in Wittgenstein in escaped, escaped it, in escaped way. So we can find he had very open mind to every, to each possibilities, to each possibility for us to look at our philosophy and language as they are. So that's my conclusion. Thank you. Um, thank you so much for Professor Zhang. And uh, I can see we have a lot of questions. So Professor Sluga, could you give a, like a quick response? I know there's a lot of questions to answer, but maybe we can like discuss um, also in the discussing session. So could you like give a quick response to Professor Zhang's comment? Yeah, I can, I can be very short here. I mean, I realize I offered a kind of grab bag and, uh, and there are lots of things going on there. Um, so firstly, um, is it useful to think uh, about Wittgenstein in connection with the idea of liberation? And uh, this is uh, Reed's proposal that we should think about Wittgenstein in these terms. And I think the answer is for me, yes. Uh, that is an illuminating line of thinking. Uh, but uh, is it sufficient to think about Wittgenstein in terms of liberation? And there I'm uh, in favor of a more pluralistic approach to Wittgenstein. I'm somewhat critical also of the therapeutic and resolute readings because they seem to me too reductive and just forced to, in the end, to ignore too much of what Wittgenstein actually does. Uh, so um, yes, useful, but not sufficient. Uh, third point is that we need to think, if we, if we want to pursue that theme, then we really do need to think about this question, what exactly does Wittgenstein mean by liberation here? Um, and I would expect more than Reed actually offers us here, and one would have to situate that into a larger context. So uh, Kant and Schopenhauer certainly come to my mind as relative rep, uh, re relevant reference points, but I want to say Nietzsche and Foucault, yes, uh, as well. So we need to situate uh, the idea of liberation in Wittgenstein in this larger philosophical context in order to make any precise sense of that. Um, I, I leave it at that um, uh, and, and won't try to respond to Professor Yi's points in detail. Uh, can you just comment on the two chat questions here uh, that we had? So one of them was about quietism. Yes, I mean, Wittgenstein, Wittgenstein definitely has a, 